Let's pray. God, we know that your spirit is with us. We're apart and yet bound together in you. So God, we pray that your spirit would move in us as individuals and as a church to open us up, to open our ears and our eyes, our hearts and our minds so that we might hear a word from you. And God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all of our hearts will be acceptable and pleasing to you, God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When I was in elementary school, I was in the school choir. We lived in a little town called Ladysmith, Wisconsin, and just to be clear, being in the school choir wasn't any kind of distinction. Everyone was in the school choir. That was music class for each grade, and and I loved it. I loved singing. I loved being a part of a choir. It was fun for me. And a couple of times each year, we would do some kind of performance, a, a concert in the fall and in the spring for all the parents to come and see how cute we were dressed up in our white shirts and black slacks. And I have only one clear memory from elementary school choir. It was the day after our fifth grade spring concert, and we were watching the video of our performance from the night before. There were a couple of songs in that performance where, how shall we say it, where, where my voice was a bit more prominent than the others. Now, I hadn't been assigned a solo in those songs. I just was super excited to sing. And while we were watching this video, I could hear my friends in the class talking about me, about the way I was singing. I don't know what they said, but I know they laughed and they were laughing at me. And from that day on, I have not wanted to sing in public. Not once. Now, I've done it. I do it all the time, but I have to force myself each time, all because of those kids in fifth grade choir. And I'm telling you this because we're in this series about songs and singing, and I know very well that we all have different relationships with music. Some of us know a lot about music. Some of us know a little. Some of us like this kind of music, and others of us like that kind of music. And we all have different comfort levels with singing, don't we? Some of us love to sing as long as we're in a crowd. Some of us love to sing as long as we're by ourselves. Some of us haven't sung in years because some kid in the fifth grade laughed at your voice. So regardless of your knowledge of the songs we sing in church or the songs we talk about in this series, regardless of your comfort level as a singer, there is one thing I know to be universally true about music. It opens up a part of our heart, a part of our soul, a dimension of the human experience that opens up in no other way. This is a reason why God's people have always sung as part of worship, because through music, God opens up a part of us that we sometimes didn't even know was there. And we're able to connect with God in even deeper and more wonderful ways. So today we're going to keep on with our Praying Twice series. It's about some of the songs that we sing in worship. And the song that we're digging into this morning is called Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. It's one of my favorite songs. We sang it to our kids when they were infants, rocking them to sleep. And, and what we'll discover is that this song has its roots in a passage of Scripture. It's a story, this scripture passage, about the people returning to God. They had strayed. They had been unfaithful to God, but now they're turning back to God. Turning back to the God who has always loved them. The God who has always been faithful to them. The God who is seeking after them each and every day. It's from the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel, chapter 3. And I invite you to read it with me if you'd like. 1 Samuel, chapter 6, beginning in verse 3. Then Samuel said to all the house of Israel, If you are returning to the Lord with all your heart, Then put away the foreign gods and the Astartes from among you. Direct your heart to the Lord and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So Israel put away the balls and the Astartes, and they served the Lord only. Then Samuel said, Gather all Israel at Mizpah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. So they gathered at Mizpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord. 
They fasted that day and said, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the people of Israel at Mizpah. When the Philistines heard that the people of Israel had gathered at Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the people of Israel heard of it, they were afraid of the Philistines. The people of Israel said to Samuel, Do not cease to cry out to the Lord our God for us, and pray that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. So Samuel took a sucking lamb and offered it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel, and the Lord answered him. As Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to attack Israel. But the Lord thundered with a mighty voice that day against the Philistines and threw them into confusion, and they were routed before Israel. And the men of Israel went out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and struck them down as far as beyond beth Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Jeshanah, and named it Ebenezer. For he said, Thus far the Lord has helped us. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Several years ago, Elizabeth and I took a trip to Canada, to Vancouver and Victoria to be exact, and one of the things we encountered on our trip was something called an Inukshuk an Inuk shook. Here's a picture of one. You can find them all over the place. There are big ones and small ones. Essentially, each one is a pile of stones. But it's a pile of stones that served a very particular and very important purpose. You see, the indigenous and First Nations people in Canada built an Inuk shook to mark sacred places. They would build one of these stone monuments on a place that was important to them. A place where something beautiful had happened in their lives. A place where something terrible had happened in their lives. A place that was important for their history. A place that was meaningful to their family. And they would also build these inukshuks to mark the way. To mark the way from sacred place to sacred place and to mark the way from these sacred places back home. So when you were between places and you saw a pile of these stones, you knew you weren't lost. You knew you were headed in the right direction. You knew you'd be able to find your way home. Our scripture story this morning ends also with a pile of stones. Verse 12, this is our key verse for the morning. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Jeshanah. It says stone, singular, but I think the image we should have is of Samuel taking a large stone and setting it on top of a pile of stones so that it is up high, so that you can't miss it, so that you can see it from far away. And he's doing the same thing that the First Nations people in Canada are doing with the Inukshuks. Samuel is marking a sacred place. For the people, this is a sacred place because this is the place where they recognized that they had been unfaithful to God, where they recognized that they were headed in the wrong direction, where they recognized the depth of their sin and turned back toward God. It was an incredibly important moment in their life, and this is where it happened. So now, for the rest of their lives, there's a monument that marks the place so that they can remember, so that they can remember the way back to the Lord. There is no doubt about it. They will again turn away from the Lord. That's what people do. They will again let sin creep into their lives. That's what happens to us. But now they have this pile of stones to remind them that they can always return to the Lord. And what happens next in verse 12 is even more important. Samuel set up this stone between Mizpah and Jeshanah, and he named it Ebenezer. Ebenezer is Hebrew. It means stone of help. He named it Ebenezer, for he said, thus far the Lord has helped us. This pile of stones that they put together isn't just to mark a place where they, the people, did something. It's a reminder for all time and for everyone who will come after them that the Lord has done something. In the story, what the Lord does is help. Help the Israelites defeat the Philistines, which is something they could not do on their own. In fact, up until this point in the book of 1 Samuel, all the stories were about how the Philistines kept overpowering and embarrassing the Israelites. 
And now they've marked the place where the Lord has helped them. But notice how Samuel says it. He doesn't say, the Lord helped us here. That's true. That's what happened. But what he says exposes an even deeper truth. What he says is, thus far, the Lord has helped us. Meaning, everything that has happened thus far in life has happened with the help of God. Every moment that has come before this moment has been a moment in which we experienced God's help, whether we knew it or not. Let me say that again. Every moment that has come before this moment has been a moment in which you have experienced God's help. Think about that for a minute. Every moment of your life, you have experienced God's help. That includes all the moments before you know, knew God, all the moments before you put your faith in Jesus. In those moments, God's grace was helping you, helping you to find your way to Him. Every moment of your life, including the moments you felt furthest away from God, including the moments that turned out to be the worst moments, because of something you did or because of something done to you, God was helping you then to be stronger than you thought you were. Through friends who picked you up when you had no strength left, God was helping you to not give up or to start again after you had given up. Thus far, the Lord has helped us. It means that every moment until this very moment, God has been helping us. And that's true for individuals and for our church, too. Next year marks our 75th anniversary as a church here in Bel Air. Every moment of our life together, the Lord has helped us. The Lord has helped us to worship and to serve. The Lord has helped, to, helped us to care for one another in sickness and in health. The Lord has helped us when we've been weeping and when we've been celebrating. The Lord has helped us to reach out to the world around us. The Lord has helped us to send people on mission to various places locally and globally. The Lord has helped us to learn and to lead. The Lord has helped us to heal when we've been hurt, to forgive when we've been wrong. The Lord has helped us to succeed, and the Lord has helped us when we've failed. Thus far, the Lord has helped us. And here's the thing about saying that. Here's the thing about saying, thus far, the Lord has helped us. We believe that it's going to continue. We know that it's going to continue. There's no question about it. God will never stop helping us. Today, in this moment, we can say, thus far, the Lord has helped us. And tomorrow, no matter what happens between now and then, tomorrow we can say, thus far the Lord has helped us. And the day after that, and the day after that, and every day after that, we can say, thus far the Lord has helped us. It's always true. But it's perhaps particularly important to remember that this year, isn't it? You know all about the, the continually developing dangers of the coronavirus. You know all about the terrible tension of this election season. You know all about the worries that we have for our world, for our country, and, and for our families. 2020 has been a wild, wild ride. And thus far, the Lord has helped us. Samuel put up a pile of stones to make sure that we never forget that thus far, the Lord has has helped us. You know, I was writing this sermon at our kitchen table the other day, and, and, and I looked over at the counter, and this is what I saw. A little pile of stones, a, a little Ebenezer built on our kitchen counter. Here's what happens. Every day, our little girl comes home from school with a pocket full of rocks that she has collected on the playground. And every day after school, she unloads that pocket full of rocks somewhere around the house and makes a little pile of stones. I went looking the other morning. Here's what I found. One, two, three, four, five, six little piles of stones plus one big pile of acorns, which in our house are about the same as stones. Our, our daughter wasn't even home when I went looking for these piles, but there they were, all these little reminders of her presence, her personality, her laughter, her. 
The song we sang right before the sermon, Come Thou Fount, it's a prayer to God. And the second verse starts like this, Here I raise mine Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come. In other words, thus far the Lord has helped us. And I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. We can do today the same thing that Samuel did long ago, set up an Ebenezer, a stone of help. It, it doesn't have to be a pile of stone on your kitchen counters, but, but it could be. Your Ebenezer could be anything that reminds you of God, anything that reminds you that thus far the Lord has helped you. So here's what I did. I wonder if you might want to do it too. I made a list of Ebenezers in my life. None of them are actual stones, but they are all reminders of God's help. I want to share just a couple of them with you to get you thinking about the Ebenezers that I suspect are all around you. So this one, this one is a little dove paperweight. It's a little dove paperweight that I got at the first church I ever served as a pastor. It was a gift from one of the matriarchs of the church. She's gone on to glory now, but when she gave it to me, she said, I want you to have this, and I want you to keep it for a long time, but when you look at it, I don't want you to think about me, and I don't want you to think about this church. I want you to remember the Holy Spirit who is with you always. She was a saint. And of course, when I look at it, I remember her, and I remember that church that I served, but, but I also remember the Holy Spirit who helps me every single day. It's on my desk now, and when I look at it, I remember thus far the Lord has helped me. Here's the second one. This second one is smaller. It's my dad's class ring from high school. I keep it in a box at home. I hardly ever look at it. My dad died when I was three, so, so there are no happy memories that go along with this ring, but it's nonetheless a monument to God's help in my life. A monument to all the protection and provision that God gave to a boy who grew up without a dad, to a family that experienced unspeakable tragedy, but began to heal with God's help. I didn't bring the third Ebenezer, but it's my son. He's named James, just like my dad was, and it felt like a miracle the day he was born. It felt like a miracle and I know it wouldn't have happened without God's help. He's seven now. And every day of his life, he's been a reminder that thus far the Lord has helped us. What are the Ebenezers that stand in your life? What are the things, what are the people, what are the places that remind you of God's help? Think about them. What are they for you you should write them down. You should make a list. All the Ebenezers, the things, the people, the places that remind you of God's help. Pretty soon, you'll start to see them everywhere. All these proverbial piles of stones, all these Ebenezers, all these Inukshuks that mark the sacred places in your life and that show you the way home to God who loves you, who's helped you thus far, and well, who won't ever stop. You know, the old preacher joke used to be that all you needed for a good sermon was three points and a poem. Well, I don't know how many points I've had today, but here's the poem. It's our song for the day, and it will also be our prayer to God. Let's pray. Come, thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise mine Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he, to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. O oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, 
bind my wandering heart to Thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart. O oh, take and seal it. Seal it for Thy courts above. Amen. Amen.